I'll begin. So I'm Jonathan Havercroft. I'm a senior lecturer in international political theory at the University of Southampton, and I'm with uh, Tracy Strong, who's... Uh, we have two titles. So one is uh, a professor of uh, political theory and philosophy at the University of, of Southampton and a distinguished professor at the University of California, San Diego. Yes, and so today I just wanted to, I've just finished reading uh, Tracy's recently published book, Politics Without Vision, Thinking Without a Bannister in the 20th Century. And it's an excellent book. And so I just wanted to ask him a few questions by way of kind of introducing him to the department here and kind of more broadly on the internet. So the title of the book uh, kind of has a double illusion going on, right? You're alluding to Sheldon Wollin's classic study uh, on the history of political thought, politics and vision, and also in the subtitle, you're alluding to Hannah Arendt's description of judgment as uh, thinking without perceived categories. Right. So how do you see this book as in certain ways responding to their work? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the, the, the actual title of the book, Politics Without Vision, uh, was not its original title. The original title was, in fact, the subtitle, and that was the Arendt reference, uh, Thinking Without a Bannister, which is actually a phrase she takes from, from Nietzsche, though, of course, she doesn't say that. Uh, both of the reviewers for the book for Chicago suggested separately that the actual title should be Politics Without Vision, with reference to Sheldon Wolin's classic, originally 1960 studies, uh, politics and vision. Uh, what Sheldon had argued in that book was that, in fact, the great political theorists provided a certain kind of epic account, as he once called it, or, or sort of a foundational account for ways of thinking, paradigms, we, he once put it, uh, about the political realm. And he, uh, he put this all in a 400-page book, which was enormously influential upon people in the 1960s and 70s, and remains in public in print to this day. The thing about that book, and what led me to take the title, was that there are a range of people whom he actually does not consider. He starts with Plato, he goes all the way down to 1960s organizational theory, but there are a number of people missing, and the people missing are in fact Nietzsche, Weber, Freud, Lenin, Lenin makes a very brief appearance, Carl Schmitt doesn't make any appearance at all, Heidegger makes no appearance at all, and Arendt, interestingly, makes no appearance at all. And to the degree that Sheldon actually wrote about those people, he wrote about them in a way which was basically in the end dismissive. And uh, I had been working on a number of those people, and it seemed to me that in fact one of the things that one might do was to begin to look at people like the ones Roland did not look at, for some kind of resources for expanding or elaborating or making more complex political theory and, in fact, democratic theory uh, in the contemporary period. And so that was, it was not originally intended to be a book in direct dialogue with Wolin, but after, in fact, uh, the reviews, uh, I did add a section where I tried to set put myself in relationship to, to Sheldon's book. The Arendt was uh, a, came really from her latter work, her work, uh, her late work, her work uh, in particular uh, on Kant, and particularly on Kant's third critique. And what was important about the third critique for Arendt, it became very important as a kind of structuring mechanism in my book, was Kant's distinction in the third critique between what he calls determinative judgment and what he calls reflective judgment. And very briefly, a determinative judgment is when you start out with a general set of principles or rules of foundation, if you want, and you go from there to a, a, the understanding of a specific case. You start with the general, you go to the particular. Uh, mathematics would be that sort of thing. Uh, reflective judgment, you start from a first-person singular judgment and you are to move to a first-person plural judgment, which it struck me was in some sense the basic thing that we do in politics and political theory. I make a judgment about the world, but I intend that judgment to be valid on a general or broader, perhaps even universal basis. And that's a difficult thing to do because I can't compel 
in the way I could with mathematics, anyone else to make that move. I have to show them things. I can't provide a knockdown, drag out argument. I have to give them some kind or help them with some kind of way of seeing. And perhaps I can, and perhaps I can't, and perhaps, in fact, I may be wrong. Hence, this is a way of thinking which has seemed to me very fruitful for thinking about politics. And what I tried to do with the book was to take this basic distinction, and specifically the notion of reflective judgment, and to try to spell it out as far as I could in each of the particular thinkers that, I, that I've named. And that's why Arendt became not only the next to the last chapter, but in fact became a uh, kind of organizing principle. I was quite surprised at that, mm. but it, I had been looking for the organizing principle for about 10 years and uh, kept on not finding it, and then suddenly it struck me this was it. That's Super. So you, this book, you cover seven major political thinkers, mm. mostly from the 20th century, right? Two of them were Nazis. Right? You have one revolutionary socialist in Lenin, and you have several others who were kind of either ho outright hostile to democracy or at the very least kind of very skeptical, skeptical of it. Yes. Perhaps Arendt's the only Democrat in a lot, and she was certainly <laughs> <laughs> she was certainly her kind of very yes. yeah her anxieties and her ambivalences about democracy too. So. There's a couple of interesting tensions there, right? One's that certainly the 20th century, as Eric Hobsbawm called, it's the age of extremes, right? Yes. But there's also, you know, a story or a kind of story that, that liberal Democrats like Francis Fukuyama like to tell, that actually the end of the 20th century is the triumph of, of liberal democracy. Yeah. Uh, and so there, there certainly are no liberal Democrats in this book. No. So given that you think these theorists are exemplars of 20th century political theory, and for now, at least, state socialism and fascism are in some kind of retreat politically. What do you think these thinkers can teach us now in our kind of liberal democratic moment? If yeah, you will? thank you. That's a, the, a starting point here was the sense that most liberal political thought, or at least Anglo, Anglophone liberal political thought, since the Second World War, has been written either explicitly or tacitly with the, the presumption that we had to make sure that it never happened again, meaning the kind of things of the 30s and Nazis and so forth. Uh, you will find in a book like Robert Lane's Political Ideology, for instance, that democracy only works if you have what he says, and I'm quoting here, a touch of anomie, meaning people can't care too much because the vision was they had cared too much in Germany in the 1930s and that was extremely dangerous. What struck me was that while there is importance to that way of thinking, it has as an effect to shut down a variety of possible paths. It's a bit as if you had a path going along and a gate was placed here, or a wall more accurately was placed here, and anything beyond that wall was forbidden, was, uh, was, not, was, to be was to be avoided. Part of the conceit, but part of the argument of the book is in fact, if I open that particular, if I knock that particular wall down, or if I ignore it, can one go further down that path and find, indeed, ways that go to the kinds of disasters that you're, you know, the kinds of problems that you're talking about, that you mentioned, but also find other, as it were, paths not taken, which are only possible if you don't stop political thought at a certain uh, point, uh, as most liberal political thought does, which has really to do with uh, a kind of insistence upon a certain kind of separation between public and private. The other concern there was that I was convinced uh, and that the 20th century was in fact not a century ending in the glorious future time that, that Fukuyama has, not a century as Steven Pinker put it in a book that came out about the same time, about the same time where you have the better angels of our nature being mm -hmm. manifested but was, as George K. Ted once called it, the morally worst century in human history. Now, if you don't think that about the 20th century, this book is probably going to uh, seem extremely esoteric and pass you by. If, in fact, there is some truth to that, that it was, the, the in some sense, the morally worst century in human history, and I detail, for instance, simply the number 
of, of deaths by various means in one of the beginning of one of the chapters, uh, which is quite extraordinary when you start piling up World War I, World War II, the famines, everything that goes in between. If you accept some of that, then in fact it follows one has to look for resources elsewhere than they have been typically uh, sought in Anglophone liberal thought and so forth. And the, my presumption was that the people who took this, these kinds of uh, disasters or that which produced the disasters in the 20th century seriously were in fact by and large, or were involved in those disasters, were in fact by and large people who were neither liberals nor for the most part Democrats. And as you say, our relationship to democracy was complex to say the least and so forth. So that's why I looked to these particular people. The conceit of the book was that one would be able to, by taking down this wall as it were, finding to find further down this particular path of their thought turns which could go in directions that they did not take or only dimly saw, in the case of Max Weber for instance, uh, only dimly saw, but which could provide some kind of resources for beginning to think about uh, political, political theory in the 20th century in a manner which was at least compatible with a democratic orientation. That's, that's why I chose those people. It's a risky thing to have done because these people are fascinating and one risks finding oneself subject to their, fa to their fascination, as many people have been, as we know. Yeah. So there's this eighth person that's <laughs> eighth hanging person. on this book. I call him the eighth thinker, the eighth if you thinker, will. Yes. Right? If you, he's, he doesn't got a chapter at all, but he's certainly... Definitely in the footnotes, you follow the text of the footnotes, but also kind of pops up at, at different points, is, is Stanley Cavell. So I actually think he is the eighth thing in this book. Yes. So, so how do you see his work kind uh, of in relation to themes of, of this book? That's, that's complex. I mean, you're absolutely right that, uh, that Cavell is, is really a strong influence in how I go, how I, on the discussions in the, in the book. Uh, not that he actually, with a few exceptions, ever actually discusses really any of the people that I talk about. Uh, Cavell's an American philosopher, uh, recently, uh, well, some ten years ago, retired uh, from Harvard. Uh, and what attracted me to Cavell uh, was a particular concept that he has, which he calls uh, acknowledgement. An acknowledgement is, to take a very simple example, is this kind of thing. Uh, you're late. You come in late. I know you're late. You know you're late. I know that you know that I know you're late and so forth. But it doesn't matter. Knowledge is not enough. You have to, in fact, do something. In this particular case, you have to say, I'm sorry, I'm late. In other words, and that particular thing you do is the particular thing which is appropriate to the particular circumstance and is not subject to general rules. We're back to the reflective judgment question uh, in Kant that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this particular notion, the notion that in fact knowledge is not enough, it's not a matter of knowing more, it's not a matter of even what you do know, that something else is required for things to be right between us. Uh, became, became extremely important to me and of course tied in and in fact Cavell does make this link to work that I had done on Rousseau earlier where in fact you find the same kind of, of argument that certain, for certain kinds of things it's not a matter of knowing of what you know or knowing more or getting greater knowledge it's a matter of doing the appropriate action uh, at the appropriate time. The interesting thing about that, of course, is that it does not permit a general rule. And it forces one to deal with a particular circumstance directly and responsibly as oneself, rather than by invoking some kind of underlying rule or overarching uh, principle and so forth. It makes life, as it were, a bit more difficult because you have no escape at any particular point but it also forces one uh, 
to actually confront precisely what am I doing at a particular time and precisely how is this related to what is happening in my presence. And that's sort of what I took from uh, Cavell. There's a lot of uh, specific kinds of things uh, and quotes in Cavell. What I did not want to do is what is being done increasingly, and it's a good thing that's being done increasingly, but I didn't want to do it. And that was, in fact, to write specifically about Cavell. What struck me is that Cavell actually was a resource for me, rather than a subject of, of analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I must say, I, I, I know Cavell, and uh, I have found that both his uh, presence as a human being and is consonant with the kind of philosophy which he, uh, which he uh, has been developing over 40 years now. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, that's so, uh, so one of my interests is in theories of sovereignty, and one of the preeminent theorist is one of the subjects of this book, Carl Schmitt. Uh, so as you, as you explain in the book, uh, part of Schmitt's critique of liberalism is his tendency to promote what he calls and what you call aesthetic subjectivism, right? The inability in a liberal society for either groups or individuals to uh, decide between preferences, if you will. All right? so, so how does Schmitt's theory of sovereignty respond to this problem? Oh uh, yeah, uh, Schmidt was one of the two Nazis that you mentioned at the <laughs> beginning, of course, uh, joined the party in 1933, never apologized for it, as neither did Heidegger for that matter. Uh, and Schmidt was in fact, I suppose, struck by something that you've actually written about, Jonathan, very, very uh, interestingly and extensively which was the impact of a certain kind of skepticism as to the resolution of certain kinds of questions, particularly value questions. This is what produces the, uh, the kind of aesthetic indifference, as it were. You know, how can we decide these things? It's sort of like, do you like chocolate ice cream or not, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, Schmidt found, I think correctly, that this meant that liberal politics were incapable of dealing with the most important questions which would conf could conf confront any political system. His solution to this was his, as you know uh, very well, was his, his theory of sovereignty. The sovereign is he who makes the decision in an exceptional case. The sovereign is also he who decides what case is exceptional. What the sovereign does in effect is that in the absence of rules, because Schmidt argued uh, that in fact many circumstances that one confronts politically are not subject to resolution by rules, but in the absence of rules, what was needed was in fact for a decision which was authoritative and general, which, and he doesn't say this, but one might say, in effect took the place of the absent rules. So it became the imminent form of the absent transcendent. And um, Schmidt, this was what Henry Kissinger once called, without specific reference to Schmidt, though I know he knew Schmidt, the necessity for choice. You have to, in fact, make the choice. The advantage of that, of course, is that it does resolve certain kinds uh, of, uh, of problems. The disadvantage of that is that it leads to a kind of politics which is extremely problematic uh, and one sees it for instance uh, you know when George Bush, George W. Bush uh, announced at a press conference that I am the decider clearly whoever was advising him at that point had been reading Carl Schmitt and he had to, to come to that resolution. It also leads to a situation where People, in effect, people who have power, will be able to make decisions, as in what Donald Rumsfeld said, I know that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, period, therefore we're going in. That's the kind of decision which resolved you know, a, an aporia, which resolved a, a, a lack of clarity, a lack of certainty, but of course it produces a disaster. And in some sense what Schmidt is trying to do is to take 
the kind of lack of foundations which I'm interested in, which is the starting point for my considerations, and figure out a way to replace them with a essentially a constructed or decisional foundation, which requires a certain vision of sovereignty. And that's what we got from Schmidt, and it was very powerful at the time. It was influential on all sorts of people across the political spectrum. And the interesting thing is that it has been taken up in the last 20 years by people on the left, thinking of Chantal Mouffe and people mm -hmm. like that, as a way of criticizing liberalism. And it's it both is a critique of liberalism, but it is also, you know, as I've tried to suggest, you know, you know, quite dangerous. If you look at the uh, 1985, I think it is, Encyclopedia of Political Theory from Blackwell's, there's no entry for Carl Schmitt. Ten years later, that would be that would have been impossible. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a, it's a from the sociology of knowledge point of view, the the sort of uh, sudden rebirth of Carl Schmitt on the left, right, and the center is uh, in different ways. Uh, is extremely interesting, mm -hmm. but your your book, you know, provides I think really interesting ways of understanding why the Carl Schmitt phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, captives of sovereignty, it's called, since he hasn't said it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I didn't have much to say about Schmidt. So no, you didn't. But it's, no, no, but, but you could. You yeah, could I could. Yeah, easy. I think after reading, I read this only after I finished the book. So after yeah. reading it, that's where it dawned on me that that there might be a similar line here. So it's kind of the last question, this is a kind of a way of conclusion, right? It picks up on this idea of, of kind of thinking without foundations or these anti-foundationalist critiques, right? So normally continental philosophy, whatever that is, the continental tradition, which I think this book basically is part of, um, are accused by, say, positivists, Anglo-analytic philosophers, liberals, conservatives, as either being crypto-normative, which is kind of how Habermas famously described yes. Foucault's work, or outright nihilists, right? And so part of the reason for this is because continental philosophy often critiques the foundations, right? Yeah. It goes after the foundations and challenges them, much in the way that Schmidt does with the liberal tradition. And normally I find that scholars working in this tradition either evade this charge simply by kind of ignoring it, pretending it's not there, or they kind of provide an alternate that often I find is kind of simply either smuggling back in the assumptions they should critique or kind of recreating the thing. This book doesn't do either of these things, I don't think, right? It, instead, it kind of grapples with the foundation of, or the non-foundation of political philosophy throughout. So kind of what, what resources did you find by working uh, through all these thinkers for, for grappling with those problems? Yeah, you know, this, this is a complex question to which there could be a a very short or very long answer, and I'll try a slightly in between one. Uh, part of what I'd like to, I, this book leads me to try to do, uh, especially in the very last chapter, the conclusion, is to begin to bring together uh, a, no, moral, a notion of what's been called moral perfectionism with uh, democratic theory. And moral perfectionism is essentially the notion that uh, each individual needs to, in fact, live his or her life in such a way that they become, and one might say, more of who or what they are or what they can be. One has to be careful. One doesn't sound like a recruiter for the U.S. Marines here. Uh, you find it in Thoreau, you find it in Leverson, it's certainly all the way through Cavell, but you find it also in Rousseau, you find it elsewhere. The accusation which often comes out of this is, aren't you being anti-egalitarian? Aren't you being elitist? And my response to that is to say there are actually two forms of elitism. One is the, the shall we say, the standard form of elitism, which is to say why the, since some people are simply better than others, or they are more than others, or they are more noble, they are more good, they are more whatever. They, they are superior beings. Uh, followers of Leo Strauss often have this kind of opinion. The other form of elitism, which is actually, in some sense you might say, is the one that I am quietly pushing in this book, uh, is to say, no, the question is really, 
Why is it that more of us are not more than we are? Why is it that more of us live what Thoreau called lives of quiet desperation? And if you do that, you of course have to ask what are the both external and internal weights upon people that keep them from becoming, as it were, what they could be or what they can be, but sort of enmesh them or admire them in a certain kind of, of mediocrity and conformity. Uh, that is a form of elitism which I think is in Nietzsche, though many people would argue that. I think it actually goes all the way through, in one way or another, all of the people uh, that I look at. And were the book to have continued, it would have taken me to uh, the early Frankfurt School, to critical theory, uh, and a set of related things like that. But that's the direction I hope the book points in, and that's the direction in which, if uh, as I'm able to continue the thoughts of this book, uh, that I would want to, to develop again. I have some of that, I think, in the last chapter, where I tried to bring together the question of acknowledgement, the question of moral perfectionism, uh, but it, it needs, as it always does, it needs to grow still. But thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And so very the book, once again, just does Politics Without Vision, uh, Tracy Strong is thinking without a banister in the 20th century. So thank you very much. Well, thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan.